answering my earlier question. I figured I'll push my luck a little bit and ask you another one. Um, getting a, maybe, I don't think I'm getting any more personal than what I already asked, but here we go. Um, feel free, free to answer or not. But how many of you have ever at some point in your life been shushed? You know, the shh. Any, has that ever happened? Now, listen, I'm not talking about when you were a, a child and a teacher or a parent did it. Um, I mean when you were an adult and a full-on stranger just completely shushed you. Because it's, it's okay to admit it. We're, we're, in a, we're, we're amongst friends. It's okay. We can admit these types of things. Because we live in a culture that there, we take certain orders and we, we understand just the shushing principle. And I've noticed that there's different ways to shush people. There's, there's the nonverbal shush, right? That's when you like bead your eyes out at the person and you just try to like bur- burn a hole through their skull so they have some sort of sense. Um, there's one that I, I typically like, I use with my kids a fair amount because I don't want to be seen as the shushing parent, right? Um, so you kind of just do the old, like, calm it down, just do one of these. But there's nothing better than the classic finger to the lips and just shh, right? We, we've all been there, you know, there's certain places you can't, you, you, you're not supposed to be making as much noise as you normally would like to. Um, like in a library, you know, you get shushed a lot in a library, so I'm told. Um, or if you're, if you're at a movie theater and, and you're, that, you're that guy who forgets to turn off his phone or at least put his phone on vibrate and the phone goes off, people love to shush. They, they think they're better than you, but it's a genuine mistake and they shush you, right? And so do you stay for the movie or not? I don't know. It gets awkward. There's, there, there's other places where you get shushed. But um, I thought I'd share a, a, a more recent um, experience where, where I was shushed in a public place. Um, and it was amongst other people. See, every year um, we have a bit of a tradition where three families, we all go camping. And uh, it's not so much camping as it is more of a caravan rolling into town. Um, because our camping isn't really camping. It's kind of glamping. You know, glamorous camping, so we bring all the amenities, you know, we bring the nice chairs, we, we brought a barbecue in the past, and you know, we really rough it. Trailers, and, and there's three families, so there are six adults and 11 kids. And so there's 17 people in total. So when we roll into the campsite, whether or not you believe in God or not, I'm sure everyone whispers the same thing under their breath. Oh God, please don't let them set up shop next to me. Right? Because it's like dust is mounting in the background. And, and, and we roll in. And you know, we're courteous and we, we try to, you know, be kind. But there's lots of us. We have bikes. We have kids. You know, we're, we're running all over the place. And that's just the adults, really. Um, and so we, we try to keep things under control. And on one particular night, um, we're all around, you know, the campfire. And we're all chatting. And... Amongst the hum of whatever we were talking about, we hear something coming from beyond our campsite. And anyone who's camped know that's not uncommon. You know, maybe it's a raccoon. It wasn't. Maybe it's squirrels chasing each other. It wasn't. It was someone from another campsite shushing us. And their shush was so loud that it was louder than whatever we were clearly doing. Um... And I've noticed that there's always two kind of responses that people give when they're shushed. Um, It's the fight or flight response, right? People who get shushed sometimes go into a fight response of, oh, 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 really, you're shushing me? Well, I'm going to shush you right back. Or you think this is loud? You haven't seen nothing yet, honey. I'll show you loud, right? There's people like that. They, They just go at it, get aggravated and aggressive. And then there's the flight people Um, people who look around for like a kid to blame or something because you're just so embarrassed or like a rock to crawl under or do something like that. The interesting thing about this story is all the kids were already put into bed. So I was looking to find a hole to crawl into because it's kind of embarrassing when you um, get shushed. I say all that because we come to a, a place in the Bible where I think it's one of the great shushing passages. I don't know if you, you know, look at stories and categorize them the same way that I do, but it's, it's a place towards the end of Jesus' ministry where it's about a week before Jesus is going to be crucified, 
And so, so much is about to take place. And so Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. There's this sense of anticipation amongst his disciples and his followers as they're getting closer and closer. And along the way, they're, they're going through a city called Jericho. And we're told that as they enter into to Jericho, um, there's a blind man begging on the side of the road. Now that would not have been uncommon in Jesus' day. It would have been rather common to actually see people with, with disabilities uh, begging along the side of the road because they were unable to work and generate income on their own. And so they were dependent upon the generosity and graciousness of others. I'm sure we can relate a little bit because I'm sure we've all been in places where we have seen people begging. People who are on the margins. People who are incredibly vulnerable. And, and we don't know their entire story. We don't know the entire situation. But, but there's often this, this, well, what do I do? How, how do I respond? You know, am I in a hurry? Am I, am I busy? Am I preoccupied with something? So it's kind of awkward. I don't know what to do or what to say. So, so maybe I'll just kind of walk by and, and, and you know, hope they don't notice me and I won't notice them and we'll just continue on or... Or sometimes we may choose to, to give some money or, or, or begin a conversation or, or maybe even in, invite them to go for a cup of coffee or, or, or to have a meal together. Do, do something along those lines, but, but it's not uncommon. But imagine if as you were walking along the road and maybe you took the path of, I'm just going to kind of keep on walking, the person stands up and begins shouting at you begin shouting in your direction. Uh, needless to say, it would probably get your attention pretty quick. Well, that's exactly what happened. Jesus is walking along the road, and there's a crowd, and the disciples are with him, and, and suddenly this man must, he was told that this is not just a normal crowd, this is not just a normal guy, this is Jesus who is walking by. And we know from his response that Jesus' reputation must have preceded him. He, he must have heard that this was the man who had been healing people who had been lame. He had been healing people who had suffered from leprosy. He had even been healing people who were blind. And so imagine you're the blind guy on the side of the road thinking, this is my chance. And so he begins to shout as loud as he can, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Probably sensing they're getting further and further away. Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And nothing seems to happen. You see, what's interesting is the crowd must have noticed that he was there. Because what do they do? They shush him. We're, we're told in the Bible they rebuked him, but a, a shush is really a rebuke. It's really a tell, telling someone, be quiet. You're being inappropriate. Now is not the time. And so they rebuked him. They, they told him to quieten down. And so what would the man do? Would he just say nothing? Would he just be quiet? I mean, the, the crowd has spoken. No, he goes the fight path. He's like, you will not quieten me down. He cries out even louder. Have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. So obviously Jesus was walking. Jesus now stops and says, call him. Bring him to me. We're not told this part, but I'm wondering if you were part of the crowd, if you were one of the disciples, you would suddenly have this lump in your throat and think, oh shoot, we missed it. We, we, we miss something. Jesus is, is stopping. And then Jesus does something really interesting. 
he, he has the man come to him, and he asks this amazing question. He says, what do you want me to do for you? What, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, to the average ordinary Joe, it would seem kind of obvious what this guy wants. But Jesus is not average. He is not ordinary. He, he's the Son of God. If anyone would know what this guy wants, Jesus would know. But what is he doing? He's, he's, having, a, he's having a conversation. He's, he's beginning that, that first step of, of actually presenting the desire to have a conversation with him. To, to perhaps potentially build a relationship with him. And so he says, what do you want me to do for you? The man says, I want to see. I want to see. And we're told that immediately the man was healed. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Now for the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at some of these real personal encounters, these these one-on-one conversations that Jesus has with individuals very close to his death. And we want to look at these conversations and begin to see, where do I fit in the midst of this? What, what, What does this begin to mean to me? Now, in this story, the temptation is to go the way of of looking at this miracle of healing, which is amazing, which is incredible, which is so much we could learn from. But if you would indulge me, I don't want to go there this morning. But rather, I want to focus on the response of the crowd and begin to ask the question, how did they miss this opportunity? I mean, how did they not see him? How, how did they not respond? You see, this, this was not just the, the masses or the crowds or the unknown that were with Jesus. It would have been his disciples. Those that had been with him, not days, not weeks, not months, but years. These are the ones who have, would have seen the healings. These are the ones who would have heard the teachings. These are the ones who would have been reminded over and over and over again what it is that Jesus desires us and them to do. Yet, they missed it. Now, I'm not saying that maybe the disciples were the ones who shushed the man, but there's a pretty good case that would say maybe they were the ones shushing the guy. Because if you just back it up a couple paragraphs in the Bible, there's, there's another encounter where Jesus is amongst the crowd and, and parents are bringing their, their children to Jesus. And what are the disciples doing there? They're shushing the kids. They're, they're pushing the kids away, saying, don't bother Jesus. Don't, he's an important guy. He's got to teach important people. And Jesus is like, don't shush the little ones. Let Let them come to me. Jump ahead a couple verses. And we see the very same response. Someone in need. Because in Jesus' day, children were not as highly valued as they were in our day. Children did not have any, if at all, few rights. And so they would have been considered the vulnerable. They, 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 they would have not been considered important, which is why the disciples were actually acting in perhaps an appropriate way culturally. And then we see a guy who was blind sitting on the side of the road, and Jesus is walking by, the one who could clearly help him out, and they shush him again. And so for me... As I read this story, as I read this encounter, I ask, why did they fail to see him? I I mean, clearly they they saw him. Clearly they they heard him because he was loud enough for them to tell him to be quiet. But why did they fail to respond? Have you ever been distracted in life? Have you ever seemed to have so much going on in the midst of life that you sometimes fail to see the things that are right in front of you? 
I don't think I physically black out at times, but it seems as if I go through a day and then someone will ask me, you know, how was your day? And I'm like, I know I ate and I know I was breathing and I know I talked to some people, but wow, this, the recall isn't there. You just seem to sometimes have blinders on and you can become so focused on perhaps and end up missing the things that are so important. I want to suggest that, that maybe what was happening to, to the disciples of Jesus, to the crowd, is, is, is they, were, they were distracted. They, they could have been distracted by the very fact that Jesus was teaching them at this moment. You know, you know w- one of the times that we often shush people in life is when someone else is speaking and we're wanting to hear what they're saying and so someone else who starts to be loud or cause a ruckus, we, we tell them to pipe down, right? Because we want to hear what's being said. And it was very common in Jesus' day that for rabbis, for teachers, to actually teach as they walked along the road. Uh, because they did a lot of walking in Jesus' day. And so Jesus would often use these opportunities to be teaching the crowds as he would go along. And and so maybe they were so locked in on the teaching that they were distracted. I, I wonder what Jesus was talking about. Justice, mercy, serving the least of these. And while Jesus was teaching, they were so locked in because this was such good teaching that heaven forbid some guy on the side of the street interrupt them. I, I often wonder if at times we become distracted by wanting to learn more and more and more. Now, please hear me out on this one. I am not saying do not read your Bible, do not spend time learning more and more about what God desires for us, but but maybe there comes a point in time where we know enough, maybe, and Jesus wants us to live it out. That that we become so distracted by, by gathering more information and more knowledge that we miss the people right in front of us that Jesus is asking us to serve. Could be one possibility. A second possibility is that perhaps we are too focused on ourselves. You see, the the, the encounter right before they entered into Jericho was... (laughs) a real interesting conversation that Jesus had with James and John, two of his disciples. And so you may be familiar with this, but but Jesus had 12 guys that were closer to him than than anyone else. They were the ones who were with them in in almost all the moments. They were the ones who'd become the apostles, uh, the leaders of the church. But within those 12, there was then another inner three. And they were Peter, James, and John. These guys were told more about of than, than, than anyone else of, of Jesus' followers. They, they were the ones who were with Jesus in some of his most intimate moments. They're the ones that Jesus often told them more things about. And so there's the inner three. And of the inner three, there's James and John, there's two brothers. And, and one day, just before they walked into Jericho, James and John go to Jesus, and like a kid, they say, I want you to do for me whatever I ask of you. I mean, have you ever been asked that as a parent? And you're like, are you kidding me? I am not giving you that opportunity. I'm not just going to wipe the slate clean and say, whatever you ask, I'll give. Ask me what it is, and then I'll respond. But what does Jesus do? He asked the very same question of them that he asked the blind man on the side of the road. Jesus almost indulges them a little bit. and says, okay, what do you want me to do for you? James and John are like, Jesus went for it. He went for it. Here we go. Jesus, this is what we want. We're going to cloak it in real spiritual speak, which is they say we want to be in positions with you. We want to be on your left and on your right when you, Jesus, enter in your glory. Right? Real spiritual talk, right? Jesus, you get all the glory, but we we, kind of want to be in the picture when, when everyone knows what's happening. Really what they're saying in normal speak is we want to be somebody. And we think you're going to be a somebody. And so we want you to rise us to the top with you. We have ambition. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. 
first of all, I don't think you even know what you're asking. And, and second of all, that's, that's not for me to give. Well, the other disciples hear about it. Yeah. So just think about children for a moment. And think if you heard that one of your siblings went to one of your parents and asked them, listen, listen, I want the biggest piece of cake. Don't, my brother's name is Jonathan. Don't give Jonathan even any cake. He doesn't need any cake. I want, I want some cake because you're awesome, Dad. You're awesome. Give me some cake, right? My brother heard word of that. You know what he would do? He's two years older than me. He would take me out backyard and he would show me how much he loved that and appreciated that. Right? He'd be annoyed. And so were the other disciples. But I don't think the disciples were annoyed because they're like, come on, guys, you should be more humble. They were annoyed because they didn't get to Jesus first. They, they didn't get a chance to ask him. And so this is the stage that is set. As they're walking into Jericho, they're all annoyed because they're focusing on themselves and, and they want Jesus to kind of take them to the top. And as they're walking into Jericho, There's a blind man who's in incredible need. And they're distracted. And they walk right by him. Now, I kind of want to pull back a little bit and not lay it on the disciples too much for, for two reasons. One is, I really appreciate these encounters in the Bible. Anyone here, or if you ever have a conversation with people who have, have a question or, or, or really challenge, you know, the authority of Scripture, you know, really wonder, is it, is it true? You know, can it be trusted? You know, one of the most helpful conversations I have is just simply pointing people to read some of these types of encounters. Because if you're someone who's trying to make yourself look good, If you're someone who is inspired by God, you're supposed to be some of the heroes of faith that the disciples are often billed to be. Why would you include a story where you just walk by a blind guy, shush him, tell him to be quiet, because you look like a schmuck? You you, you do not come out looking good at all. So if you want to make yourself look good, you know, why would you include these encounters. You know, maybe just fast forward a little bit to the place where you actually brought the guy to Jesus. Forget the whole shushing part. And that's why I appreciate these stories. Because we begin to see the grace. We we begin to see the reality of how as followers of Jesus, sometimes we miss the mark. Sometimes in my life, I'm a schmuck. And And Jesus doesn't allow me to continue to behave that way. He he wants to correct it. But there's a second reason. And the second reason I don't want to be too hard on these guys is I ask myself the question, who am I in this story? I believe one of the most helpful things we can do whenever we read the Bible is ask that question. Who am I in this story? Where would I land? And, and sometimes it's more challenging, but for this one, for me anyways, it becomes pretty clear by process of elimination. Um, I, I'm, I'm not Jesus. That's pretty obvious. I'm not the blind guy on the side of the road. I must be part of the crowd. And so I begin to ask myself the question, how do I respond to to people in need, to, to the vulnerable, to, to the people on the margins. It, it's going to look different in terms of our, our society and, and our situation, but, but how do I respond to those people in such need in this world? And it's a critical question to ponder because Jesus is incredibly concerned for these people. But more than that, when we fail to respond and help those in need, it begins to mute our message of who Jesus is. You've probably noticed, 
you know, fewer and fewer people are coming to church. Fewer and fewer people are, are interested in, in Christianity and, and are kind of just not interested in Jesus. And, and I think there's some, some reasons for that. One of them is, I think people actually know a little bit about who Jesus is. Whether or not they believe in him, they, they understand a lot about what he talks about. And what a lot of people in our world see is a disconnect from Jesus' desire to help those in need, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the poor, and the church's response to it. And so they see this disconnect and think, well, I I, I don't want to be a part of that. I've been reading this interesting book by Jen Hatmaker. I know some of you have read it here. It's a book called Seven, and, and she really wrestles with some of these questions. But a statement that that she made that really kind of struck me was perhaps one of the challenges with the church is that we spend too much time blessing the already blessed. Do we spend too much time blessing the already blessed? And in our blessing, we become distracted. We, we fail to see those that sometimes are literally right in front of us that are in significant need. And so how do we respond? As I read this passage, it's, it's not a sense of guilt, and, and I really hope it's not a sense of guilt here this morning, but the reality of grace. And I say that because of one detail that cannot be missed. You see, Jesus, after this encounter, didn't take his disciples back in the back room and say, listen, fellas, you missed it again. Smarten up. We're a week away. you got to get this right. They're a week away. These are the leaders of the church. This is what Jesus is going to be handing off. And these guys are walking by blind people and telling them to shush. He doesn't do that. But the encounter must have been so significant that they didn't miss what happened. Because it wasn't just a blind guy. It was Bartimaeus. And if you read the stories of Jesus, rarely does a person get a name. Right? A a few verses later, Jesus encountered a rich guy. I don't know the rich guy's name. He was the rich guy. But this guy is Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. So so we know a little bit about this guy. The disciples would have known who this man was. It, 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 It would have been an impact upon them. It would have been so significant. And so as I unpack this in my own life, I go back to the question that Jesus asked James and John, that Jesus asked Bartimaeus, when Jesus says, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? And I think how I answer that question speaks into the reality of am I too distracted? Am I too self-focused? I'm not saying don't, don't ask for things in your own life. But I find that I go down the wrong path when if all I ask for in my life are things for Joel or the extended Joel circle, then that's problematic. That I may become blinded to the people in significant need. And so one of the things I have begin praying is, Jesus, give me eyes to see what you see. That's, that's too polite. What I really pray for is, Jesus, smack me in the back of the head when I need to be interrupted. Because if Jesus didn't stop, Bartimaeus would have been ignored. It's only when Jesus stopped that suddenly the greater reality began to sink in. And I know that life is busy. And I know that life is distracting. And I know there's many things on my mind. And so oftentimes what I need Jesus to do is to stop me so that I begin to see what he's already watched. 
to see those people in need. And then to begin to respond, to begin to take action. You know, the great thing, but also the incredibly frustrating thing about all this is it's not necessarily about some program to do. It's we never know when it's going to happen. But it's allowing God to give us eyes to see. Because some of the great ministries of this church, some of the great ministries that, that, that we see growing up around us are because Jesus stopped people in their tracks and gave them eyes to see. Gave them a heart to move. And so perhaps you consider that question this week. When Jesus asks all of us, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want from me? For me, it's that Jesus would stop me when I need to be stopped so that I will see and that I will respond so that my belief in Jesus is not about just simply how much information I can consume but rather truly living the way he desires me to live. I invite you to please stand as we sing together.